Hi, I'm Kevin Murphy, and I'm here with my colleagues, Casey Mulligan, Tom Phillipson, and Robert Topel. I'm here to talk about their experience and how they use Chicago economics to uh, analyze some important policy issues, in particular, a focus on Operation Warp Speed and the response to develop a vaccine for COVID-19. Let me turn first to Tom Phillipson, who, along with Casey Mulligan, played a pretty an integral role in that project. So Tom, you want to talk a little bit about what you did and how your experience at Chicago and your training and expertise you developed here uh, really was influential in that effort. Yeah, so first let me just for the audience who are not super familiar uh, with Operation Warp Speed, what it was. It was essentially a government effort to let the private sector innovate a lot quicker than they usually do, particularly in terms of uh, uh, streamlining FDA, not so much by regulation or deregulation in this case, because there's not, there was not enough time for common period, et cetera, for new regulations, but it was basically a process innovation that made it go a lot quicker back and forth. You can think of FDA essentially being like a journal if you're an economist or if you've been in academics, whereby you submit your results to that particular place, they go over it, et cetera, and come back with comments and revisions of clinical trials in this case and then ultimately rejects or accepts your results in terms of efficacy and safety of the product that you're applying for. And what Warp Speed did was to speed up that process. If you think of a journal process, you know, it takes a year many times for journals to complete a process. That's not actually productive time of reviewing it. It doesn't take a year to read through and get everything in line. It's much shorter than that, but it's sitting idle many times uh, in between. It's similar to FPA. So that was one sort of non-regulatory streamlining or uh, speeding up of FDA interaction with the industry. The second one was that we uh, proposed subsidies for producing vaccines at the same time that they were being considered for approval. So basically at risk production, which in the private sector will not take place because about only about a one out of 10 compounds that go into FDA come out as approved. So many times production starts after the approval of FDA as opposed to in parallel to the approval of FDA. So those are the sort of main components of, of what actually uh, Warp Speed did. Now, the president at the White House was not sort of uh, uh, <clears throat> thinking independently of how this could be done. There was sort of an ongoing process at the White House of deregulatory efforts overall, in particular at FDA. So at FDA, we had you know worked with Scott Gottlieb, who was the commissioner head of FDA, to deregulate generic entry, which is about 95% of prescriptions in the US, uh, and, and thereby been able to lower drug prices for the first time in 50 years, something that Casey was essential in sort of documenting when he was at CEA. In addition, we had sort of right to try initiatives that the president was pushing hard on the, uh, with Congress to let people go outside FDA, particularly with cancer and other diseases where there's not a safety issue. And lastly, there was a report, and I'll talk more about that uh, probably later, uh, by the Council of Economic Advisory, which I was the acting chair of at the time, essentially uh, outlining the value of fast vaccine production in the pandemic. That report occurred in September 2019. We had no idea, obviously, that three months later or four months later, this would be central to the country, if not the world. Uh, but that outlined a lot of features of warp speed that people then actually hit the ground running with thinking about how to launch this more quickly. Yeah, let me, talk, let me come back to a couple of things you said, just so it's clear. Uh, Tom, one of the things you talked about was speeding up the process, and you talked about that in the context of a pandemic. Can you talk a little bit about why speeding up the process is such an important element, particularly when it comes to pandemic response? Yeah, because the disease is growing, right? So with any kind of prevention, what is important is, you know, that you get in early so that, you know, you don't have this uh, viral, literally viral, we think of viral for the internet, but in this case, it's the biological term, 
of a basically a multiplying exponentially when people don't respond behaviorally. <clears throat> also, I think, you know, getting in early is therefore very central, whether it's any kind of form of prevention. The thing about medical innovation in general, and you see this across many kind of health behaviors, is that many times medical innovation is the cheapest form of prevention. So if, if you look at HIV, you know, if you, be, if you believe biologists, we're here on Earth to basically replicate our genes. So sexual behavior is very hard to change in that case for HIV. And it was medical innovation that basically controlled that disease. Same for uh, the coronavirus, I think, in the sense that behavioral intervention, and Casey uh, has looked at this quite uh, successfully, kind of documenting how much the behavior costs for the disease itself, which is sort of a longstanding literature in the health economics literature. It was really costly, obviously, in terms of the foregone economic activity that had to take place to reduce uh, transmission. So, you know, innovation, I think, this is, Corona is one example of a repeated pattern, I think, where medical innovation turned out to be the cheaper alternative to prevent the disease. And it's very important to get that out quickly, obviously, before too much damage of other forms of prevention, such as foregone economic activity has taken place. Yeah, you know, Tom and I, or most of our careers have been here at Chicago um, doing academic work and trying to build on what you and Bob did and what Lester Telser did or Milton Friedman, Gary Becker, Sam Peltzman. I mean, I, we were learning from all those things. And when we went to the Trump administration, we found ourselves in the middle of a battle between those who thought problems are solved with more regulation versus those who thought, you know, maybe some of our problems are due to regulation. And FDA, in the academic sphere generally, uh, and, and especially in Chicago, FDBA has been the poster child for that that debate. Um, you know, Peter Temin had a book years ago about, you know, maybe the FDA is slowing things down and that's that's doing more harm than good. So we, we kind of were thrust into that battle. And, you know, the president was, he's not an ideological person. He was just sitting there kind of absorbing um, what was going on. Um, and... He's results oriented and wanted to see results. And I think one story I think worth telling is um, relates to what Tom said about deregulating the FDA in terms of approving generic drugs. So this is for COVID. Um, the president's one of his main campaign promises is that he would lower drug prices. And we were having this should we regulate or deregulate sort of battle. So I remember one day I wrote wrote a draft tweet for the president to broadcast that said drug prices declined in 2018 for the first time in nearly half a century. Our policies to get cheaper drugs to market are working. And that, that was a draft. It had to be approved, including by the Department of Health and Human Services, who that was totally opposite of their narrative. Their narrative is things will only work once we regulate more. Um, and I can remember having a meeting where the HHS army of, of regulators were throwing out a lot of red herrings um, about why what I just said shouldn't be made public and the president shouldn't talk about that. You know, this consumer price index should not be used to measure an industry's inflation, they said. And, and you had communication people. These are people with no economics or statistics training. They were the referees and they had to make this decision. And, you know, I remember Murphy teaching us I've seen Murphy teach many times about price indices, why they're important, how they work, what the weaknesses are. And, you know, that really came that day, that really came helpful. And I was able to explain to non-economists, you know, this, the CPI uh, has a lot of value and you, and you want to look at it and maybe the president ought to be bragging about it. And, and brag the president did. Um, and he, he bragged about that over and over again. And being the results-oriented guy, he saw that, you know, deregulation is helping me keep my promises. And he didn't forget that. I can remember the last time, you know, I'll just finish off with the last time I was in the Oval Office with, also Tom was there. There were 13 COVID cases and we were talking about, you know, health policy and a bunch of the White House staff were saying, you know, we're frustrated. The FDA is slow again. And 
you know, most of us staff had the attitude like this is an unfixable problem. And the president stood up and said, no, don't worry, guys, I got this. I've done this before. I deregulated in uh, prescription drugs. I've gotten the FDA to back down before, and I promise you I'm going to do it again. Um, and that, I think that was the beginning of uh, the president's engagement with, the, with how deregulation, uh, removing government barriers, let me say, would be uh, very important for fighting COVID-19. I, I think I would add to that. That's a great point. I, I think around that time, we've been going back and forth and CEA in particular, because I had actually spent time in the drug in, industry, both research-wise and commercially through a company, worked with pretty much all the big companies in that industry. We were kind of the firewall between HHS coming in with a lot of sort of uh, top-down regulatory reforms uh, at that time. And the president was leaning pretty heavily on CEA and also DPC, which was Joe Gro- run by Joe Grogan at the time, to basically p- provide an alternative view. <clears throat> and some of the evidence that we used or kept talking about was a study that I did with actually with Ernie Burt at MIT about 10 years ago or something like that on the sort of speed safety trade-off at FDA. At FDA. Everyone wants FDA to go quick, <clears throat> excuse me, but you would don't want to sacrifice safety in that process. And we actually did a study when we looked at a new reform at FDA called the Prescription Drug Use of the Act. It was not a reform, it was a, actually a congressional action that speeded up FDA. And we looked at, you know, did that actually increase the amount of withdrawn drugs on the market? And it didn't. And the benefit was but the benefit of the masses of drugs coming on quicker were about three times larger than a huge upper bound on the unsafety of drugs generated by that act, estimated by attributing every unsafe drug after the act to the act, and that's therefore an upper bound. So that evidence got discussed in terms of like, you know, yes, we want FDA to be to to uh, you know uh, be the arbitrary on safety, but it's doing it too slow relative to what's efficient. And I, I think after that was sort of presented, I think, you know, it turned more in towards the White House to deal with these issues as opposed to HHS, which is very much driven by lawyers and doctors, maybe rightly so. But, you know, HHS is regulating about, you know, 17, 18 percent of the economy. So there's a lot of economic impact what they're doing. And, and it's very sort of little economic analysis, particularly Chicago style economic analysis. That's sort of more skeptical of what they're doing that uh, that influenced them. I thought and I thought our work on uh, on doing that uh, really was impactful on the president. Yeah, I want to turn to Bob now for a second. I think both Casey and, and Tom mentioned innovation and the role that innovation played in not just uh, the vaccine development under warp speed, but really in dealing with many diseases that we've had to deal with. And I know, Bob, you've thought about this issue quite a bit and actually we've done work on it. Some of us, some of it with me, some of it on your own. Can you talk a little bit about the role that innovation plays and, and why innovation is, is so important and, and such a critical component in the health economics area? Uh, yeah, well, I think a lot of it has to do with the work that you and I did together on the value of innovations. And um, the, we, we, we calculated the value of innovations that occurred in the past, the potential value that can occur in the future from reducing the incidence and mortality of various diseases. The one that came to my mind when I was, when I was uh, thinking about our discussion today was we did a calculation oh, 15 years ago now of what would it be worth to reduce mortality from infectious diseases and pneumonia uh, by 10%. And that's, it, it, it's ignoring all the other consequences of trying to avoid those diseases, but just reducing those mortality by 10% of those things would be worth, in today's dollars, something like a trillion dollars. And so if you thought of if you thought of COVID as sort of ad- adding to the mortality that might occur on a continuing basis from, from infectious diseases and pneumonia, then that's kind of a ballpark of what the, the, the steady state life, lives lost might be worth. 
or what an innovation would be worth. And if you can cure it, of course, it's going to be worth many times more than that. I want to come back to something that, that, that Tom and Casey mentioned, because there was a lot of discussion about the Chicago approach to regulation. And often in the Chicago approach, we thought about the, the regulators being captured by the industry. George Stigler was very famous for, for, um, for working in that area, and also Sam Pelton. But a lot of the flavor that came out of Casey and Tom were talking about seemed to be differently important. And that is that the, the, the people in the agencies are agents. That's why they're called agencies. And authority has been delegated to them to make a lot of decisions uh, by Congress because they created the agencies. And the incentives of those in the agencies may not align with the, with the with efficient preferences or efficient outcomes because when you be, speed things up or you say that you ought to do things different, you're actually usurping some of the power of those people in the agency. They're going to resist, and they want to extend their power. And so that's kind of the tension that comes up when, uh, in a lot of areas of regulation and, and their application of the law that they've been assigned to, and they can slow things down. And I think, I think it's a, a big step forward what Casey and Tom have done in their service. Yeah, I, let me pick up a little bit on what you said, because I think there's a related point. I know Casey has talked about this before. When you think about the incentives of people who are in those agencies, and, and this is not an attack on them as individuals, indeed, I think many of their actions can be predicted by just economic supply to anybody who is in that position. And I know, Casey, you've talked about this, just, just for example, the relative cost and benefit of them to them of having a problem developed, say, with a drug that they've approved, versus having large benefit that would accrue from approving an extra drug. And can you talk a little bit about that, Casey, and why, you know, too slow might be what you'd expect as a matter of economics? I mean, just two, two kind of mistakes. I think I, I learned this from Peltzman and Milton Friedman, I think, talked about it too. You know, make the mistake of having a drug come out too late or not come out at all. Um, like Tom said, nine out of ten don't make it. Or they can make the mistake of letting a dangerous drug or a drug that's not that impressive in terms of its efficacy come out. Um, and, and the second one is the one where they're going to get punished. And there were some famous cases right around when Sam wrote his first paper. Uh, there were some famous cases that made the national news. And, you know, it's embarrassing for the regulators, and they they have those famous mistakes in their mind, whereas the opportunity costs are always harder to put on the news and, and harder to criticize somebody with something that would have happened but didn't instead of pointing them toward, you know, an accident that actually did happen. And uh, that's, a, that's a natural bias of the process. And right. And that applies to anybody who is in that position, right? Those are just the incentives. You get punished if you make a visible mistake. If you make a mistake of not approving something, nobody might ever notice that, you know, the thing that didn't happen. And, and that's a very real part. And once you realize that, it seems to me, you have to take that into account in dealing with policy issues. 